Well, good morning, Galilee. Good morning. Uh, it is good to be here this morning. Amen. All right, get situated here. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, grab them and open them to the book of Haggai. That's where we're going to be this morning, the book of Haggai. If you've got one of our pew Bibles, you can find it on page 974. Um, if you don't have a pew Bible, one of our Bibles, I can't help you. All I can tell you is go to your table of contents. Don't be too, too proud to, to do that and find it because it probably only takes up one page out of the thousand or so that are in your uh, Old Testament. So find the book of Haggai. That's where we're going to be this morning. Um, yes, I do plan on preaching a verse-by-verse sermon through an entire book of the Bible. Luckily, it's two pretty short chapters and... I'm not used to being finished till noon. <laughs> just saying, just saying. Haggai, well, y'all should be pretty accustomed to this by now. So if you will, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning with one simple request, that you would open the eyes and the ears, the hearts of the people sitting here today, so that your word would just come alive in them and affect change in their lives. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, you can have a seat. Well, we're going through the book of Haggai. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Haggai. We just don't know that much about him. He's a minor prophet in the Old Testament. As I've said before, minor prophets are only called minor prophets because their message is more brief than the major prophets like Isaiah. Haggai didn't, didn't, didn't speak for very long. It's a very short short time frame with which he spoke, and we don't know a whole lot about him, but what we do know about Haggai is very specific dates, because he tells us, he gives us to the exact day when he was speaking, and that helps us because we can know when we look through the history of the Old Testament exactly what was taking place during his day. So it's a very helpful thing. We also... No, you know, from verse 1, he says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month. He's giving you exactly when he came and when he spoke. And to to know a little more about Haggai, uh, another book that's very helpful to us is the book of Ezra. So here's what I ask you to do. Keep your place in Haggai, find Ezra in your Bible as well. I'm asking you this morning to keep, keep your place in two different books, I know. I know, tough, i got to be difficult. It's to the left in your Bible. Again, if you have one of our pew Bibles, page 470. If you do not, uh, good luck. (laughs) Look, take your bulletin, maybe tear this off and put this in Ezra, and then keep this in Haggai or something. I don't know. Put a peppermint, a piece of gum, whatever you need. But keep your place there in Ezra all the way to the very end of the sermon. Don't think we're done and get rid of it. Hold that place. Ezra is a very helpful book when studying Haggai. 
So what we learn when we read through uh, Ezra is about the exile of the Jewish people. And we find out what really took place. So uh, Ezra, let's start off our reading in Ezra. Ezra chapter 1. I want to read the first four verses in Ezra to kind of set the stage for Haggai. This is what it says. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. This is a decree from a pagan king, the king of Persia, that, that the Jewish people should leave. So what, what took place uh, in 586 B.C., uh, you've got the Babylonians who, who had exiled the Jewish people. All right, exile means to be forcibly removed from your homeland. So 586, if you like to take notes and stuff, these are dates that I scribble in the beginning of Haggai. It just helps me keep track and make sense of things. 586 B.C., they're exiled and they're brought out to Babylon. And the Babylonians completely leveled and destroyed the temple of God. Destroyed it. Fifty years later, so you go from 586 B.C. to 536 B.C. Remember, B.C., we're counting down to zero as you move ahead in time. 536 B.C., the Persians come along and overtake the Babylonians, which means now the Persians are the ones who have all of God's people, the Jews, under them. And the Lord works in the heart of the king of Persia, and that's what we just read in Ezra 1. Now that king of Persia says, okay, you all go back. Go back, collect offerings. He even has all this gold and silver and everything that he sends with them. And, and this king says, go build a house for your God where you can worship him. And they get to go back to Jerusalem. And not everybody went, but a certain group of people most guess somewhere around 50,000 of the Jews left and went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild it. And they go back, and if, you, if we had time, if you keep reading through Ezra, what you see is that they go back and they clear off all the rubble, they get everything out the way, they lay this new foundation, they've got all these materials there, and then they stopped. They quit. Nothing it all happened from 536 B.C. to 520 B.C. 16 years, nothing happened. That's what we see in Haggai 1, the second year of Darius the king in the sixth month on the first day of the month. So Haggai starts with 16 years of nothing. No worship in the temple, no sacrifices for sins, None of that. So that's where we get going with Haggai. You know, I think maybe some of the descendants of the people of Haggai's day are the same ones working on the road by my house. <laughs> Boy, they did a fantastic job of tearing that thing up to pieces to get it down to this base foundation. And I don't know, I hadn't seen a worker there in a month. We have been driving through, I think the dirt road back at Cat Island is in better shape than the highway in front of our house, but, but anyways, Haggai 1, that puts us in Haggai. Uh, let's start by looking at verse 2 of Haggai. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. 
They say it's not time yet. That's what the people say. 16 years now, and they're saying, not, not yet. It's not quite time. It's just not time yet. You ever, you ever start off on something, even something good and noble, and then you just stop? I mean, I know I'm guilty as charged. I've done that myself numerous times. I think we've even done that in regards to our faith. How many times do you see people uh, maybe, maybe have a very convicting moment or come to faith in Christ and they start off so good and so zealous and they seem to just kind of kind of just pitter-patter out? That's what happens to these people. They're saying it's not quite time to do this yet. And so Haggai comes along. They said, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Verse 3, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? So, So Haggai's going to him and he's saying, okay, you're saying it's not time to do that, but it is time for you to live in your paneled houses. Uh, it's as if Haggai is saying, this doesn't make sense. It ain't a good time for that, but it is a good time, apparently, for you to live in your paneled house. Now, when you see that paneled house, uh, you know, some, some Hebrew uh, scholars say that you could have translated that several different ways. You can read all sorts of different options there for how you could translate that word for paneled houses. Some say well-appointed house. Some say a comfortable house. Some say a luxurious house. I think we all understand the meaning or what it's getting at, whether it's, whether it's specifically a panel type but, or comfort. But I want to go back to Ezra because I think maybe we can get a little more clarity with it. Go back to Ezra. We're going to go to Ezra a couple times. If you fast forward in Ezra, chapter 3, verse 7, I want you to notice what it said they did back in 536 whenever they first went back to start rebuilding the temple. Look at verse 7. It says, So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Look in the middle part of that verse. Did you, did you see that? that they, they gave them money to these workers so that they could go to Lebanon so that they could go bring these cedar trees back from Lebanon for the temple of God. I, what most believe is what's taken place here. They went to Lebanon to get these cedar trees for the house of the Lord and ended up using what was meant for God for their own comfort and built their own paneled houses to dwell in in comfort and in luxury. That's what they did. Now, listen, I, I don't think as a principle it's a, a good idea to, uh, to read, to look at Scripture uh, the way we look at a group photo. You know, every year we take our youth to camp and they always take a group photo and, and it never fails. Every one of them, when they come by to see the photo at the end, I mean, there's 60 people or so in that picture. Every one of them gets it and immediately, where am I? Where am I at? Where am I at? They want to find themselves. What do I look like? Is my eyes closed? What's my smile look like? You see, when we, when we automatically view Scripture and look at it as, where am I? Where am I? Well, I think we run a risk of always kind of finding ourselves being the heroes of the stories in the Bible. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a self-centered approach of looking at it. But I, I do think when you read through things like Haggai, um, the principles that we see here very much apply to you and I today. So verse 4, like we just read, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins that we see there in Haggai's day? I think you could just as easily kind of modernize that for us and ask the same question. Is it a time for you to live in absolute comfort and luxury while a lost and dying world is going to hell? Do you think we've maybe got some work to do? Do you think maybe there's something we could be doing to to, to help further the kingdom of God? Look, 
God has ordained the beginning. God has ordained the end. God is sovereign. We know that. We also know, I think, in Matthew 16, that's a beautiful passage. We know that uh, you can read through Revelation that, what does it say? That, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. God has ordained the beginning. God has ordained the end. You can also read through Revelation. What does it tell us? Jesus wins. We know that. He's going to gather his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation and worship him and be with him for, for all of eternity. We know that he wins in the end. We know that. I think Matthew 16, the great confession that Peter makes. So there, and Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yes, that's right, Peter. And upon that rock, upon that statement, upon that confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing will stop or thwart God from building his kingdom and winning worshipers for himself. Nothing's going to stop it. I think everyone in this room would agree wholeheartedly with all of that. We know it. But <laughs> this past week, you know, one of the benefits of having a four-year-old, they are full of good illustrations. Well, I had to buy a new mailbox, and I had that mailbox sitting on the kitchen counter. And uh, one night, I'd taken out the box, and I had to sit in there. Well, well, she came walking in and saw it, and, and man, her eyes lit up. She, oh, and she took off. Well, she came back around the corner with a little toy. She said, I want to mail this to my friend. <laughs> and so she opened the door of the mailbox, put her toy in, closed the door, and raised the flag, and took off. And I'm sitting there looking in the kitchen on the counter, and I thought, man, she's four. She knows how to use mail, but she, she understands how the mailbox works. That's pretty neat, you know. And just about the time I'm getting proud of her, she ran right back around the corner, walked up to the mailbox, opened the door, and then looked at me and said, it didn't work. <laughs> I said, baby, there's nothing magic about that mailbox. I, I've got to go put it out at the road. You see, the way it actually works is, you put your toy in there, close the door just like you didn't pull the flag up, and then tomorrow the mail lady comes. And she opens the door, she takes the toy out, puts it in her truck, and then she brings it to your friend's house, opens that mailbox, puts it in and closes it. Now your friend can go get it out of their mail. That, that, that's how this works. See, we laugh at that. It's cute, it's a funny story, right? But don't you think we kind of view the kingdom of God the same way? We agree that, yes, God's ordained the beginning, God's ordained the end. Do not forget, God also ordained the means by which he gets from the beginning to the end. It's not just a magic thing that happens automatically. You and I are called and commanded to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 19 right? Go. That's your job. That's your marching orders. Just like the people of Haggai's day were, were told to go out and to build, for, build my kingdom, where we can have sacrifice, where we can have worship. You can burn the incense, all those great Old Testament things. Go build this. What we as New Testament Christians are called to be about furthering the kingdom of God through winning worshipers for his glory. That's the means by which God gets from the beginning to the end. There's a parable in Luke, Luke 14. You uh, turn there if you want. You don't have to turn there, but verse 23, I, I just want to touch on the end of it. It's a, the parable of the great banquet, and, and here's what he tells them towards the end of that parable. He said, and the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. The way God fills his house is through people like you and I obediently doing the work of the Lord. And God forbid we be a church that sits back living in comfort and luxury while people go to hell. Look at verses 5 and 6 in Haggai 1. He says, Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. 
And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. People of Haggai's day quickly, it's like they found themselves working, 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 working. And just coming up short. Nothing. Because they were intended, they were created and called to do so much more. You know, I like uh, William Carey. Most people refer to him as the father of modern missions. Evangelized tons of people throughout his ministry. William Carey said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that do not matter. I think that sums up what Haggai is trying to get across to these people. You eat, you never have enough. You drink, you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, no one is warm. Verses 7 through 11. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. God uses all these farming references here that, that, that maybe seem dated to us, but, but think about the principles at play here that he brings up all the things that they did. He brings up all these farming things about busying themselves. He talks about uh, the drought and, and the grain, the new wine, the oil, and all these things. You could just as easily think of this verse as saying that, that you or we busy ourselves with building relationships, growing our popularity, our hobbies, working more hours, making more money, buying more stuff. You do all of these things, but yet you're always frustrated and feeling like you just come up short, like you're just spinning your wheels. You're never satisfied at all. Despite all your efforts, you're just never satisfied. Notice what what Haggai tells them here, two things that he points out. One, don't miss this. God is the one who frustrated their ways. He very plainly tells them, I, you, you can look in verse 9, what does God say? When, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. God said he did that. And then in verse 11, I've got that underlined as well. Verse 11, I have called for a drought over you. I've called for the drought that's impacting you. We don't often as Christians like to think about God doing anything that could be viewed as negative or bad or harmful. We don't like to think of that. But do you see what's happening here? These people are busying themselves with their own houses while the kingdom of God lies in ruins. And God is saying, okay, that's what you're going to do. That's fine. Here's the drought. Keep on. Keep planting. Keep planting. I can play that game, kind of. Could you imagine God kind of... with? saying that these people are steady trying their best they're they're trying to just get more and more and more comfort and God says it's not going to work you're never going to be satisfied I will blow it away I have blown away I brought a drought on you do you think I'm not saying every time something happens you just need to assume God did that to you but don't you think we should at least ask the question maybe just maybe uh, here's what we normally do. Oh, the devil. The devil's coming after me, right? We love to blame everything on the devil, everything. What about you? Do you think there's a chance that the reason you're spinning your wheels, the reason you're always feeling frustrated and you're not satisfied, do you think it's maybe because you're living in your comfort and luxury and not doing anything for the kingdom of God? 
It's at least a question worth asking, I believe. Secondly, notice that he says twice to consider your ways. Consider your ways. I've got those underlined in red in my Bible, and just a heads up, in chapter 2, he's going to repeat it three more times. Five times in this short little book, he tells them to consider. When he says consider, I don't think he, he just simply means think about it a little bit. I think what Haggai is getting at, he's saying he's getting uh, beneath the physical actions, right? I, I don't think in Scripture when, when God... Look, I've told the youth this, I don't know how many times I tell my own children this, God does not want your begrudging submission. He wants your heart. He doesn't just simply want you to say, fine, I'll obey you. He wants you to say, my God, I long to serve you. I long to obey you. He wants your heart. When Haggai says, consider your ways, he's saying, Think about why you're doing what you're doing. You're living in absolute comfort while my house lies in ruins. You need to think about where your heart is because all you're worried about is you and building your stuff. So when he says consider your ways, I think a good way to kind of view that is you need to repent from the heart. You need to really think about your motive behind this and why you're doing what you're doing. So he tells them consider your ways. Isn't that at the core of the gospel? When we think about it, I mean, that is the gospel. Your heart has to be changed. We have to repent from the heart. You can't just say, we all know that. You can't just go to church and then earn salvation. You're saved by grace through faith. You exercise faith in Christ because your heart's been changed and he saves you. That, that's the very core of the gospel. Look, I'd listened to Adrian Rogers' sermon a few months ago and I don't have the exact quote, but he said something to the effect of uh, something to the effect of if all you do is good deeds with no gospel, all you've done is make this world a better place for people to go to hell from. If all we do here at Galilee Let's have committees that meet and function regularly. Have some deacons and elders who lead and serve pretty good. Sing songs, listen to sermons, shake a few hands, hug a few necks, go home. And just do it for an hour and a half every week. We just come do it and that's it. If that's all we do and there's no gospel heart change, no one coming to faith in Christ, then all we've done is make this a real nice place for people to go to hell from. Let's consider our ways. Look at 12 through 15, chapter 1. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. A couple things to, to point out there. What brought them from complacency to construction? Two things in the text we just read. A fear of God based on the word of God. A fear of God and it was based on the word of God. Notice what he says. When these people all came together, they obeyed the voice of the Lord there in verse 12 they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of Haggai the prophet, that's the word of God, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Verse 12, it says at the end of verse 12, the people feared the Lord 
because they had heard the word of the Lord. Look, I, I've, I don't know how many times I've heard people talk about the fear of the Lord, the fear of God. And you've probably heard it. Look, I've probably taught it several times this way. It just seems like we have this tendency, uh, uh, Christians, anytime you talk about the fear of God, you immediately launch into explaining how fear doesn't really mean fear. Right? Anybody have that experience? Fear doesn't really mean fear. It just means be respectful, be kind of reverent, you know? Uh, that, that's all it means. You, now, now, let me be clear. There's good points to that. We, we shouldn't wake up every day shaking and terrified that God's going to come strike us down dead or something, you know? I don't want to go that far with it. But in our attempt to avoid that, I think we've gone so far the other way that we do not have a fear of God. We just don't. Oswald Chambers said, The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Or Spurgeon said, He who fears God has nothing else to fear. It's pretty good with words. Or Proverbs 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God due to the word of God calls them to repent and rebuild. That's what moved them into action. I think we could learn some very valuable lessons on whether or not we truly fear God based on the word of God. Because if we do, it's going to have some impact on how you live your life. You're not just going to sit there living in luxury. Chapter 2, look at verses 1 through 3. He says, In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing? In your eyes. Now, I want to make sure we're following with what's happening here. Chapter 1 ends with saying on the 24th day of the sixth month. That's the time marker at the very end of chapter 1. So the sixth month, 24th day, the very next verse, the first verse in chapter 2 starts off the seventh month on the 21st day. So it's been approximately a month since they started rebuilding, and now they've said, okay, we're going to rebuild the house of the Lord, and that's what they start doing. They're working, they're building the temple of God, praise God, work is happening, and now the complaints begin. No way that fits with us, right? Look, if, if, if you can keep the math in your head, 580, 586, temple's destroyed, they're exiled, 536, they come back to start clearing. That's 50 years later. Now we're in 520. There were people alive right now in chapter 2 that remembered the former temple. They saw it. They probably worshipped in it. They smelled the incense. They heard the sounds. They remember the former glory and they're saying, this will never be like that was. Look, I've struggled with thoughts like that in my childhood. We tend to romanticize the past, things like that. I've heard it here at Galilee. Man, back in the day, we had a whole softball league. There were people here uh, all nights of the week playing ball. Tons of people. And we would always share the gospel with them. We had basketball in here. We did all sorts of things. We used to have a whole big choir on the stage in there. We had an organ in there years ago and a piano, all that glory, all the people that signed that wood board going back on the left side of the baptistry as they were baptized. How glorious. It will never be like that again. Look, I found a church directory this past week from 1980 and 81. Y'all, Ellie Mae Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies was a church member. The Ellie Mae Clampett, her family's sitting right here. They're still here. How's that for former glory, right? Ellie Mae Clampett. 
the people are saying it'll never be like it was. They were discouraged. Very, very discouraged. And sometimes you and I can feel that same way, just very discouraged. Is it really going to work? Is, is, are there going to be any fruits to the labor? But our job is to simply be faithful and trust God. Look at verses 4 through 9 in chapter 2. He says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Notice that God says that he will fill this house with glory. God says, I will fill this house with glory. You don't make it glorious. God says, I will fill this house with glory. Also notice everything belongs to him. Did you catch that? The gold is mine. The silver is mine. Not yours to build a nice, luxurious house. He says it's mine. It doesn't belong to Brian or to Brandy. Doesn't belong to a deacon or an elder. Doesn't belong to this church as a whole. It's for God, for his glory. I think we would all do wise to think think hard on that, that it's for him, his glory. But notice the two things that he commands them here. He gives two commands in this passage. One, he says, be strong. I've got mine circled. If you're one of those underline or circle people, that's what I've got because he repeats it several times. Be strong, O Zerubbabel. It tells them, Joshua, be strong, Joshua. And then he says, be strong, all the people of the land. Be strong. And he also tells them in verse 5, fear not. You know that's the most repeated command in all Scripture, to not have fear, fear not? All through the New Testament, Jesus said it constantly, do not be afraid, fear not. So how are you to be strong and not fear? How do you do that? Well, he tells you in the verse. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord. I quoted, read from the Great Commission earlier, Matthew 28, 19, but don't forget the rest of that verse. Usually we just, we just focus on the first part. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Don't, don't forget what he says though. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Look, I think I've mentioned this before, but <laughs> when, when our little four-year-old chatty would tell her in the evenings, hey, pick your toys up, and it's just, oh, my legs don't work, they hurt, I'm tired, now, I can't do it. And what we learn is you can go over there by her and squat down on the floor. You don't even have to pick up toys. You can just kind of simply just move stuff around, just act like it. And boy, she'll get to putting everything in the box. She can do it. But she needs to know that, that her daddy is right there with her. It's amazing how it changes things. Even though you're not actually helping in any way, you're there with her. And she does it. Jesus says, go, make disciples of all nations. I'm with you. I'm there. I'm there with you. He tells the people of Haggai's day, you you have work to do. Build the temple. Be strong. Don't have fear. Fear not. You know why? Because I am with you. He also tells them, my spirit is in your midst. You have that. I'm there with you. Look at verses 10 through 14. He says, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
Ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Look, the, the short of that. If they went to work on the house of the Lord with an unclean heart, all of their efforts would be unholy and pure. But if they went with right motives, if they had truly considered their ways and changed their hearts, then everything they did would be holy. Their actions would be good. 15 through 19. He says in verse 15, Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? Notice he said consider again in verse 15. If you want to mark it, mark it there. When one came, verse 16, how did you fare? He says, when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Here it is for the fourth time. Consider, from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, and here's your fifth time, consider, he says. Is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. God's proclaiming, he's telling him, I'm going to bless you from this day onward, but keep in mind that came right on the heels of him talking about his heart, his motives, being clean or unclean in what he's doing, why he's doing what he's doing. That This, please, this is not some health, wealth, and prosperity thing where we can say, amen, God's going to bless me with adding zeros to my, into my checkbook or something. No, no, no. He, he tells him numerous times, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Look, I think of when I first came to Galilee. I, I don't mind admitting this now. I've shared this with a few of you in the past. I came from a church that was about half the size of Galilee, but we had a far, far, far bigger youth program at our church. Sunday morning, it was 100 people there, the church total. That was it. But on Wednesday nights, we regularly ran 50 to 70 for a youth worship service in the youth building. We used to have 100 nights pretty regular where we would really push and promote and have 100 teenagers on Wednesday night at that tiny little... We had a bigger Wednesday night youth worship service than we had a Sunday morning worship. It was a, a crazy thing, but that's what I was used to. We, we just had tons of kids from the community that came. We had a full band made up of college and career age students. I mean, it was awesome. Well, as fate would have it, and as the Lord would have it, things started unfolding, and I found myself coming here to Galilee. And I looked at that little cinder block building over there, and I thought, oh, you just wait. You just wait till I get my hands on that place. I'll show you youth ministry. And four years later, I was still sitting back going, seriously? <laughs> It's like me and the same eight people just kind of like, hey, <laughs> what, what happened to 100 nights? I was humbled because of my motives. They, they just weren't pure. Now, the Lord has blessed that ministry since then. We've grown. Uh, it's been incredible. This past year, we brought 66 of us went to youth camp. So it's been, it's great. I'm grateful. But, but I had to learn some hard lessons. And, and I think that's the whole point of Haggai here. That, that the Lord is telling him, he, he, he's like, hey, consider your ways. And he goes through this whole story about clean and unclean. Okay, 
I'm going to bless you. Look at 20 through 23. It says, The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. The Lord promised to bless Zerubbabel once he had considered his ways and repented he he said I'm going to bless you and when we read through the book of Haggai I, I, I read through Haggai and I've looked through it I even talked through it one time before fully realizing this because I, I think you would be left with just assuming well these people are just straight up sinful they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing right? they're really guilty of the sin of omission not commission it's not that we've got all this record of, of them actively going out sinning. It's what they're not doing. That They're not going out and, and furthering the kingdom of God by building his temple for worship. It's more what they were not doing. And we can look at these people in a pretty harsh way. But go back to Ezra one more time. Ezra chapter 4. Uh, I just want to read two verses because, well, for time's sake, we'll just read verses 4 and 5. He says, speaking of the people, so keep in mind, we're going back now to, to 536 B.C. Y'all got me? Haggai is 520. Ezra, what's being mentioned here is 536. This is what led to the 16 years of nothing happening. That's where we're at, Ezra 4. It says, now when... Uh, Uh, Verse 4, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. If you keep reading through Ezra, what you learn is that persecution broke out against the people of God. That's why they stopped. That's why they quit. Now listen, hear me out. Just because someone's persecuting you, you do not have an excuse to quit living out your faith. Don't hear me say that that's the point of this. I'm not. You could say there's reasons and excuses. There's not a good excuse, but you at least can see the reason why they stopped, right? I mean, persecution. Could you imagine if someone came to you and said, hey, you're going to lose all your retirement. They were being sued, brought to court. They were being made. Whatever physical acts were happening, it says that they were fearful. They were afraid to do this work. Look, I'm almost afraid to wonder how many of you would still be here actively serving and giving if the government came in and said, if you give to that church, you lose all your retirement, all your benefits, everything's gone. You better quit giving to that church. I think it's slimmed things up quite a bit. And maybe we can see, okay, maybe I shouldn't look at the people of Haggai's day quite so hard as I have been. When I think through the story of Haggai, clearly they're living in comfort. I think clearly you've got several groups of people that make up this 50,000 or so Jews that are there in Haggai's day. There are some who are just disobedient and they're not doing the Lord's work while they live in luxury. But I, I want to share a story that, that, uh, that I heard a while back that I just think <laughs> gets a point across in a very clear way. Uh, the story this man tells about being at, at a large church and, 
and this particular woman that went to church with him. And, and this woman was, uh, was very obnoxious. That's how he describes her, just extremely loud and obnoxious. I mean loud as in like bright, colorful, kind of not, not verbally, you know, audibly. She wore these dresses that were not like normal clothes you wear. He said, I don't know where she would find these things, but they were brightly colored and really big and big old heels. Her hair was done up, her makeup. He said her makeup was the envy of an undertaker. <laughs> That's how thick it was caked on, and she had a ring on every single finger that she wore, big gold chains, and, and he, he just he went on and on about how I, I just don't understand how somebody with a clear conscience could be that full of themselves and parade yourself at church, show up late to church as to draw more attention to herself every week. Come walking in with all these gold on her and everything, and, and he just avoided her at all costs and said, I, I just cannot believe that this self-centered, sinful woman would come around like that. Well, one day she came in, and go figure, the only empty spot was right in front of him. So she sits down right in front of him, and the very next thing to take place was the fellowship hymn. Well, that's what we used to do, where you'd have a song, and you greet the people around you. <laughs> and he thought, oh man, here it comes. Well, sure enough, they start the fellowship hymn, she stands up and turns around, faces him, and sticks her hand out. And that's when he looks down, and he said, I saw something that just changed everything. He saw those faded green tattooed numbers. On her arm. You know, he told the, the story... <laughs> He said, I looked up at her, and it was as if she was just looking straight through me to the very core of my soul and knew every judgmental, hateful thought that I had towards her. He said, I just felt terrible. And before saying anything else, she just looked at him and said, when I was a little girl, I experienced some of the most horrific, tragic things you could imagine. As a teenage girl who was a prisoner at Auschwitz concentration camp, she said, I made myself a vow that if I ever got out of this place alive, I will never wear rags again. She said, I plan on keeping that. And then she put her hand out and said, it's nice to meet you. I know I'm a lot to take in, but it is nice to meet you. Listen, <laughs> why in the world would I preach on a minor prophet like Haggai on a Sunday like this? Because I have been praying through Haggai for a long time now. A long time. And every time I thought about this Sunday, I just kept thinking about Haggai and the message of Haggai. Do you, you want to see the gospel in Haggai? It, it's there. The principles of the gospel, they're there. Hey, you have a job to do. Go, go build, build, build my temple so that I can be worshipped. And they didn't do it. And he's saying, consider your ways. You need to repent. And when you do repent, hey, you can be strong You'll be blessed because I am with you. We are promised when we truly repent and believe in Him that He is with us. We get the Holy Spirit. It's there. And He will bless us just as He said at the end of Haggai. Make us like a signet ring. We'll be blessed for eternal, eternally. I kept going to Haggai because I just kept thinking about the people of that day and, and, and how it relates to kind of my goal or my vision. And, and I even talked through this with the youth and told them the same thing. And, and when I think about this, I think some of you are probably like the people we read about in Haggai's day. You simply are not doing the work that you know you're supposed to be doing as a child of God. And if that's you, I would say, 
you need to fear God and do the work. I want to be like a Haggai who can come along and say, you need to fear God. You have work to do. But there may be some of you who don't have a good excuse, but there's a reason you're not busy working for the kingdom of God. Maybe you just grew up in a home or a church environment where it wasn't modeled for you. You were not discipled. You're a product of your environment. You just don't know anybody. You just assume that's what you're supposed to do. You just go to church, do your thing, shake some hands, go home, and that's it. That's what it means to be Christian. Maybe you just don't know any better. I want to be like a Haggai and say you need to fear God and you need to know God's word. Because it tells us what we should do. Let's go. We've got work to do. But then there's others of you who may be like that woman who dressed herself, you could say, in such an elaborate paneled house is what it looked like, but deep down inside there was a lot of hurt. Maybe some of you have experienced tragedy, sorrow, that's left some deep scars that have paralyzed you in your faith. Listen, I've spoken to three different people in the last eight months, ten months or so, that have had essentially the same story, that have told me, this church, not some church, this church hurt me badly. I've resented this church. I've not wanted to take part of this church because of what was done to me and my family years ago. Listen, I can't undo the past. I'm sorry. I cannot undo the past. But I can't be like a Haggai and say, you can be strong and you don't have to fear because God's promised he's with us. I want to be like a Haggai to come along and say, I'm sorry, but God is with us. We've got work to do. We've got souls to save. Let's go. Lastly, there's maybe some here that I haven't even hit on yet that um, you say, well, I'm not busy furthering and building the kingdom of God. And maybe the reason you're not is because you're not part of the kingdom of God yourself. You haven't truly considered your ways and put your faith in Christ. You're just here. You're not here. You haven't given your heart to the Lord. Listen, hear me carefully. Just what we read earlier. Don't forget, God ordained the beginning, God ordained the end, and God ordained the means by which we get there. Go, therefore, make disciples. Compel all of them to come in. I want you to hear me clearly. Today is the day that you can make that choice and make a decision in your heart to consider your ways and trust in Christ. And when you do that, you can know that He will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You have the promise. And so, as we close this morning, I just want to leave that as my, my closing message for you. It doesn't even matter about what takes place here in a few minutes. Regardless of what role, what type of pastor I am, I want to be like a Haggai to come along and encourage you wherever you fall on that spectrum. Let's pray.